Ähm, äh, ja, bitte begrüßt Peter und Markus. All right, so hello everyone listening in uh, uh, on the translation. Uh, please welcome Peter and Markus. Um, thank you very much and welcome to our uh, talk about 25 years of chip card attacks. Um, uh, we're going to talk for four, uh, 45 minutes today, so there's a high compression that we have to use. Um, before we start off, um, a little introduction. Uh, what is our field of expertise? What do we do? Um, back then, in 1989, uh, we started um, investigating chip cards uh, in Brunsbüttel, a little uh, northwest of Hamburg. And during the, our time at university in Kiel and Hamburg, um, we always um, were concerned with the uh, with chip cards, and we were experts in a booming um, branch. And uh, we discovered a few uh, little um, security vulnerabilities. And then in 1999, we were uh, contacted uh, because of our activities. And um, we're still working for them today in the south of Germany, um, concerned with uh, the security of chip cards. And we both, one after another, um, were the leaders of a, a certain expert group. And what's important for us is how can you go from a very expensive um, attack that just got discovered to um, to implement it as an amateur to make it uh, simpler and easier and cheaper. So you have to know uh, if you want to so maybe it's just one attack that just uh, cost one or two hundred dollars and that uh, decides about the security of a certain chip and the private uh, um, all right so 25 years ago um, what was the chip card world like back then um, chip cards were very new back then uh, little known in the, to the public and the first uh, few chip cards that we saw in germany was the German uh, telephone card. You can see that up on in the slide, and uh, <laughs> below that the uh, a telephone cell in Eidelstedt, Hamburg. So the question is, what's behind these golden pins on the card? And this information was very hard to uh, get by, so that meant reverse engineering. The system was relatively new, and used cards were hard to get there were, um, well, there were a few uh, cards used up. So you could buy new, ca new cards at the uh, post office and uh, the costs were 12 uh, Deutsche Mark um, for small ones and 50 uh, Deutsche Mark for uh, the big ones where you got a little more value for your money. So the information for the, uh, it's a very uh, simple structure it uh, saves the amount of money that you have and there's a control logic implemented but there's uh, obviously no cpu it's a logic chip so again uh, 25 years ago how did we approach the question um, of a protocol and this is the uh, former yellow data box um, a cardboard box with a lot of cables, a few switches and LEDs. And with this um, switch, you could have various input signals and simulate various protocols on a chip. And the uh, corresponding LED shows what sort of data the card returns. And since it's an LED and not a printer or a computer, uh, all of this had to be uh, recorded with uh, pen and paper. And we quickly discovered that uh, simple usage of the card, the, uh, the data coming out always repeated itself. So 
what's uh, we had to know how are the uh, the costs coded uh, what happens when you use it to actually make a telephone call um, so for 12 Deutsche Mark you got uh, 40 units so uh, you had to make 40 um, uh, drives with a bicycle to the telephone cell, use it, then go back, then test it, see what happens, then go back to the telephone cell, use it, and uh, you can imagine. And uh, a short while later, you discovered the uh, how the uh, costs are actually coded on the card. And a little while later, we used a computer program to do that, uh, which of course meant back then a Commodore 64. Uh, thank you very much. And the uh, program in a little uh, nicer form actually um, was in the uh, 64 ER um, magazine. So back then the world of chip cards were was quite small. Um, the telephone card was the most widespread application of a chip card and you could find it in each um, portemonnaie and today you open up uh, your wallet and you can see various cards of all uh, for all kinds of purposes uh, of course mostly used for paying and uh, money transactions these uh, cards uh, you can uh, contact based so you can really uh, spot them quite easily because the golden uh, field uh, always close in your eyes and um, today they use the chip cards as a security mechanism um, much like uh, back in the past with the Commodore um, it's still sort of the same today uh, but there's uh, also chip cards that you don't recognize as chip cards uh, that easily, which are quite often the contactless cards, which you use for um, uh, going uh, in and out uh, controls and identity cards, um, which means the chip is contact <laughs> on uh, one part of the chip, uh, it transfers energy, on the other part it um, exchanges information and never mind the differences there's two large um, forms of attacks uh, and one is of course to get secret data from the card so private information that's saved on it that might be saved on it and of course uh, cryptographic keys these are interesting because once you've extracted them you can um, use the key on other chips and uh, emulate uh, the original card and you can imagine for example if you uh, if you can extract a key from one card uh, it's like when you have a key and you make a duplicate of the key uh, you can just you don't have to steal a card you can just copy it and this is uh, one large form of attack and the other one is just to change the data that's saved on the card, on the original card. So if we have a, a bank account card where uh, a certain amount of money is saved, well, maybe you could just um, uh, let the card uh, increase the amount of money that's saved on the card. And, uh, and that, of course, uh, attacks the uh, integrity of the card. Those are the two scenarios, and uh, never mind which situation, uh, which application the card is act for. So, uh, how do these attacks look like in praxis? There's uh, various methods of realizing these attacks, and you, on the slide you see um, only a few examples. <laughs> Of course, we could give you a detailed um, explanation, but that would take until tomorrow. So, uh, on each of these um, main attack scenarios, we'll just give you a few examples. All these attack scenarios you can basically divide into three classes. The first ones are the manipulative attacks, which means you really open the physical card in front of you 
and try to um, change something on the chip itself, on the system itself, so to um, to read some secret information on it later. Um, once a sort of uh, attack is that you just take um, layer by layer of the card and just um, uh, see what's inside. Besides the mani manipulative attack, there's also a second large attack called the observative attacks. Um, you don't change uh, any physical property of the card with this attack. Um, you just watch really closely what happens when it's being used. So, for example, how long does a mathematical operation take? And then you use these uh, information about time to uh, make guesses about what happens on the card. And of course, also information about magnetical and electrical currents. So manipulative and observative attacks um, actually help you um, steal secrets or information from the cards. And so obviously these attacks are about changing the cards and um, um, practical example. If I found a, a card that's uh, secured with a pin that I don't know, well, I could just uh, guess a few pins, but uh, at some point it would just tell me, yeah, you have no tries left, so maybe I just enter a random pin and exactly uh, at the point I enter it, there's uh, the response that this pin is right or wrong. and. Um, then I can just try to uh, make the card think or to make it accept the wrong pin as the right pin. So these three classes are not only applicable to uh, security controls but also to uh, silicon chips and systems. So for example analysis of game consoles, um, there you can use these hardware tags as well. So let's um, give you some more information on that. And for each of these uh, tags, we'll give you a historic example on a telephone card 25 years ago, but then also an outlook, outlook into the uh, laboratories of today. And of course, uh, what's the future like for these attacks? And last but not least, we'll uh, also try to make a conclusion what's about uh, what about a uh, smaller budget so what can you do with amateur uh, with an amateur budget or amateur material let's begin right at the top with a manipulative attack right as peter already said back then the material was quite rare so it's quite hard to get so just opening such a card you'd think twice right fantastic the first thing we do is to take an x-ray and look what's inside. Right, perhaps that's not so easy to just to take it to the next hospital and say, hmm, by the way, I need an x-ray. Probably won't work. But we think, how, how else can you get uh, x-rays? Well, back then, uh, <laughs> televisions weren't just LCDs, but they were CRTs, and the uh, wires inside would allow you to generate x-rays. So basically, we took this chip and attach it to the pipe and take a fill, put a uh, photographic film on the other side. And then we, we'd wait a few weeks. And indeed, after a few weeks, you could see the example on the, uh, the result in the top right. We have this x ray and we enlarged it. And we determined that there aren't just these five uh, exits, but there's also there are two additional uh, points which are mm, look like a debugging contacts, right? Well, this uh, enlivened our research spirit, and so we indeed opened the card, 
and uh, attached ourselves to those test contacts. Right. Well, back then, the question was, how do you even attack this, these contacts with using small means? Right, and the solution you can see in the bottom right. Right, the solution was we opened it from the back, then which allowed us to see the silicon directly, and we attached it using some uh, contact silver, and we led them back onto bigger areas outside, and we ch had a look what kind of signals are uh, appear on these test contacts, or what happens if you put in signals on these things. We can call that probing and forcing 25 years ago. Right, this probing and forcing has is even is a, still a topic today, although it's slightly different today and slightly more expensive. You can see in the middle, for example, a Focus IMD, which is a device which with which you can uh, work on the silicon from both sides very in a very refined way. And you can remove particular contacts or add additional ones with great care and detail. Therefore, you can also apply some very uh, small and uh, exact modifications. Uh, um, the details will probably also be covered in the next uh, talk. Which what's quite interesting is with these devices, although they are quite expensive, if you if they are continuously exchanged because they are they progress continuously, and whenever there's new technology, the old the even old they are always optimized so that you can always apply to this most detailed technology, and even today, there are. Uh, devices that can uh, work on 10 layer, 10 layers of silicon at the same time. Well, well, even though manufacturers say, well, attacks are not possible because we use very small tech, but as you can see, it's also possible. Well, it's also amusing to, if you want to be even more detailed, you could use other uh, devices like an atomic force microscope. These devices that are in principle capable of moving individual atoms. And obviously this also allows you to modify even the most refined technology. Using these atomic force microscopes, we also have the possibility to uh, read individual uh, saved bits and to figure out what's in these, uh, in these bits. If you want to do several things at the same time, you could use what you can see at the bottom, a microprobe station, which are basically five atomic five uh, microscopes. And you can, with this, you can measure even the individual transistors. Well, to admit, it's not the, exactly the simplest equipment, but nowadays in the big labs, th this sort of kit is uh, uh, available. Right, the question is, where, where, where does this lead us? when we do this analysis. For example, uh, we, when this leads us to an electron microscopy chip scanner. So using this tool, you can do a extremely high resolution picture of the chip. And then you uh, take off a layer of the chip, take another image, and then you sh and just reiterate this process until you have the whole chip. And you can reconstruct a wiring diagram. Well, this all this uh, technology is available today and the next question is what's the future like right long time ago use at uh, the top here you can see the standard equipment using just a microscope and just uh, look at the overall profile well you can hardly see uh, once again that was in 1990 at the CCC using the video camera we recorded it and then uh, evaluated it later Back then, you could only measure individual signals. Nowadays, using specific kit, for example, the Datenkarke, you could uh, record a lot of signals at the same time. However, the question is, how do you get these signals out of the chip? Well, that's what we thought about. How, how, how can you develop this further? And the question is, it's particularly interesting, 
what if one chip attacks another chip directly? How does that work? How could that work? For example, you could you could prepare the chip that's to be attacked using the focus of a beam such that all the contacts are led out to the back of the chip and then uh, exfiltrate these signals. And you can arrange it in such a way that they fit on an FPGA. So you put the chip to be analyzed on an, on an FPGA and the FPGA can be programmed in such a way that it would uh, send or that it can record several hundred signals at the same time and make them analyzable or can feed in signals using these contacts which means to uh, modify the chip functionality at, at runtime actively. Well again this is probably requires quite a bit of effort nevertheless we promised we would also look we would also look at some more simpler approaches which would be for example we could also do probing with uh, simpler means for example last year on the congress we did a seminar on low cost probing and we built one how you can build one yourself and in the upper picture you could see a probing uh, probing station which is in my office which which uh, comes from an industry sale and the nice thing is you can have a, you have a very nice microscope at the top and a workbench area at the top and you can uh, basically uh, touch the silicon quite uh, quite closely well unfortunately the needles are also a, a maintenance factor because they do wear out and how how can you get some more some more cheaper alternatives but that can indeed also be done using DIY for example, using uh, Wolfram wire, tungsten wire from a, a lamp. And you can generate these needles yourself. Basically, sharpen it in such a way or etch it such that it is very, very detailed and you can uh, att attach yourself to small contacts. And you can do this with a uh, process controlled. Uh, and you can um, get down to about five nanometer structure. If you need to be even more, even smaller uh, scales, you can, even in schools, there are kits these days to to build an atomic form microscope yourself, which is a pretty cheap way of uh, pre setup to uh, see individual atoms. Right, so this is just to give you a very small idea of the kinds of attacks yesterday, today, and in the future. Now let's look in the second type of attacks, which is the observational type of attack. Once again, here, let's start 25 years ago. When we opened the, when we ch opened the chip, we obviously did a took a picture of the whole chip, which is in the top. And you could see uh, several structures uh, in immediately, which looked interesting. The question is, how do you analyze such technology and luckily, we had access to an older electron uh, scanning microscope, uh, raster microscope, and which allows you to do a very detailed analysis, which is the picture in the middle. And you can uh, individual, and you can figure out which are the individual uh, saving bits. And the, and the next question is how much power is being consumed for various uh, operations, which you can see in the bottom right. And using such analysis, we can figure out that there are indeed some additional security features in the telephone card. And we um, may be able to uh, figure out what they are. Right, from the history to the current uh, state of the art. Right, using uh, doing power analysis is no longer state of the art. You could do an electromagnetic analysis you could do about 10 to the 3 better results, you can get better results, which is due to the fact since every single wire that has power generates an electromagnetic field, which means in particular that uh, any kind of copper loops of about 100 micrometers, you can, using such uh, loops, you can figure out exactly what's happening in the chip. Using these uh, spools are uh, recorded with great detail using a high-end oscilloscope, using 
using about 40 gigasamples per second oscilloscopes and a, an appropriate bandwidth. And then you can transfer this to a PC system which can uh, f uh, record these data and analyze them. Besides these electromagnetic analysis, there's also the photon emission analysis, which is uh, coming up. F approximately every 1,000th uh, switch, switching operation, there's a, there's a high probability of generating a photon, which you can actually record using particular um, photons using uh, liquid nitrogen. And you can record these infrared photons and thus uh, figure out what where is activity on the chip. And which, if you increase the resolution, you can get even more clues about the kind of operations that are taking place. And in particular, using solid immersion lenses, because these are particularly high resolution. Right, so that's the attacks observational attacks using for today. Now, once again, the question, what does the future hold? Well, continuing the idea of a chip on chip attack, usually it's not sufficient to uh, record the electromagnetic radiation in a particular place, but you want to record it several places. Therefore, the idea to use a specific chip, which does contain not just one loop, but several ones so that you can simultaneously record uh, what kind of activity is on the chip. And once again, you could do uh, some pre-processing on the chip, which allows you to uh, basically analyze data very quickly. Another possibility would be to analyze data, one, carrying on with the photo emission idea, is from the OLED area of research which would be the idea to prepare the chip in such a way that you can uh, feed, feed out a beam from the contact and then put in an OLED display so that you can directly visualize what kind of information. Once again, both approaches, you can uh, process a lot of signals simultaneously. Once again, that's quite expensive. Let's go back to the amateur uh, DIY approach. On the one hand, you could use a, uh, do an electromagnetic analysis. You don't always have to use the very expensive probes, but you could make it from your, by yourself using copper wire, or using an older uh, HD hard drive. You could take bits out, which are obviously uh, optimized to uh, detect electromagnetic radiation which you can attach you can attach it to some, some slightly cheaper digital oscilloscopes nowadays or PCs which does already give you some nice results and which already allows you to implement such an observative attack assuming the system isn't sufficiently secured well even the photo emission analysis is doesn't necessarily have to take place in the 1 million euro space but once again, there are cameras, from particularly from amateur astronomy, which you have a very long exposure time, which allow you to uh, record these same type of uh, events, which include infrared photons. Once again, to summarize, this is a... Okay, now to the third class, to the attacks. In this case, you want to uh, disturb the chip during uh, operation. For example, if it makes a security request or if it uh, decides if it's the right bit or the wrong bit. You can combine these, you can do these uh, semi invasive attacks with different tools. You can use with current or light if you put light on it. The lithium is light uh, sensitive and you can create currents with light. 1992 we thought about the how you can find out where on the chip what happens. How are the data processed? Where is the data processed? 
where does it happen? One idea was we knew then that transistors have been protected from light. The germanium transistors were in glass and covered with black paint, so the transistor is protected by light. And the idea was that the chip could be exposed on certain points with lights and see if it fails or not, and then see it has if it has always the same function. At first we took normal light with halogen lamps, but it was not enough, so we took a laser. Um, scientific lasers were pretty expensive, but luckily we had uh, a built Plattenspieler, I think it's like a CD player, a video disc player. And this glass tube is a helium neon laser and it has it comes produces a laser with a diameter of two millimeters. If you focus it on zero point one millimeter for microscopic with microscopic optics you have enough energy to uh, destroy the chip. We moved the laser point over the chip and used the chip during this moment and we could see that the chip uh, produce some reaction at some points but no reactions at other points so we saw that so we found our different areas for the data different area for the processing so we could knew what happens in a chip today uh, a lot more is possible laser technology is uh, more advanced crystal lasers and everything so one uh, typical sensor place is uh, can be seen on the pictures on the left side. Uh, on the image below, there is a microscope with optics, and under this microscope, there is a small plate with a chip on. This plate can be moved in a sub micrometer. Uh, it can be moved. So you can uh, place the chip very precisely under the microscope in sub-micrometer area. You can control everything in three axes, so you can focus the light on every point, uh, not only on the surface, but also inside of the chip and the substrate. This is really important that the laser could be uh, moved. You can use ultraviolet light this uh, doesn't penetrate the chip. You can uh, use normal light. The, this light goes through the front side and can uh, create effects, like with the old laser. But you can use infrared too. You can um, switch between infrared or other light. And with infrared, you can also go from the back of the chip because the uh, silicium in the chip is transparent, so you can also uh, expose it through the back side of the chip. You have to make some calculations, but it works really well. You can also bypass protection mechanisms like metal. Today it is totally normal that you make exp uh, that you expose the chip with lasers at different points with multiple lasers, and then and two, that you uh, fire multiple laser points on the chip. So you can double check it. You have, you have to be extremely fast. So if uh, the software makes a double check, you have to send two light uh, impulses. So you can produce the same error twice while double checking. So the laser we have was uh, could be modulated at speeds of 200 megahertz, and that was fast enough to uh, regulate it on each jump. Here the future. We uh, thought about some experiments of the future of attacks. Here again we let uh, fight a chip against a chip. This time we take a chip that directly processes light. Before you used light from the microscope on the chip, today uh, 
okay, this it, meaning that it was possible today that you process light directly in the chip instead of sending it in why, uh, with a microscope. So there are microscopic mirrors inside, so you can process light directly in the chip. And you can move lasers exactly at uh, some points of the chip and combined with the modulation you can get very far. But you can use special modulators. This is like a, modula like a DLP beamer, but it's a grid which can be modified. With this grid effect, you uh, produce interferences where light is uh, stronger or weaker at different points. So with these techniques, we hope that we have good attacks for the future. Even with a low budget, you can do a lot of stuff. Here are some examples what you can do with the simplest stuff. You don't f need 500 or 800,000 euros, but you can do everything even with a low budget. Uh, it is true that it is really difficult to put to do positioning very cheap, but micrometer screws, you can buy them very cheap. So what what became really cheap, uh, what became really cheap was the lasers, like red or green lasers from China, you can buy them very cheaply. They have two, uh, they can be modulated too. Um, you can buy infrared lasers and you could you could plug them in the camera part of a microscope or on the picture below you could uh, conduct the laser via optical fiber directly on the fit on the chip and place the fiber where you want to uh, expose the chip you can trigger the lasers via software of the pc but it uh, may be cheaper and better to use the fpga and connected by a card with the computer. In red, I want to remain uh, say some security notices. If you uh, make this and work with this, you have to be really uh, careful because um, not like small itches or scratches. Here you have um, damages which go do not go away in the eye, so you have to really be careful and take glasses and precautions. One other attack possibility, they become interesting if you have on the chip detectors which uh, detect laser light, so you want to avoid uh, uh, triggering a sensor on the chip. There is a possibility to use uh, radiation, like alpha radiation. This is uh, really known in the space technology like in the 60s, they uh, found out that uh, radiation could change electronics or create errors. And it's really interesting to use this to hack chip cards. It is really useful if uh, you want to create uh, short temporary fails. There is one attack called DFR, Differential Fo Freud Attack. You put, you insert errors in cryptographic calculations, and uh, the, with the results you can, from this attack, you can uh, go back to the uh, secret key. But you have to get the result uh, if you get, uh, if the sensor sees it, it might give out error data. It this could be, be prof this is professional, the. Radiation sources are closed, so there is no danger. We have masks um, because alpha radiation does not go through material. Even a normal transparent paper, um, it does not go through, so you are protected. And uh, you can put masks on sites, so you can only expose small areas on the chip uh, with the radiation. This is really expensive. Uh, you can't buy it as a private person. You have you have to be registered and informa informated. But we looked, how could you do it at home? How could you use this at home? 
with alpha radiation. Still today, you have some radiation sources at home. These are from the old times. They, they aren't produced anymore, but you can buy them used like uh, clock uh, pointers which are lightning in the dark they are old lightning technologies which have a lot of radiation material inside these have been replaced today but if you can buy them used you can use it on the left side you can see uh, how one of these radium elements is put on the chip and later on you can see the effects even as a as a simple person with normal paper or foil you can make a mask and so cover the parts you don't want to expose on the mask there are other techniques you can also use a uh, candle candles uh, and cover the card with uh, coal and then uh, with a small needle make holes where you want to expose the chip or with normal paint uh, you uh, <laughs> even with uh, presents and uh, for for a nail polish you can cover the chips this possibility gave us the idea that um, you should uh, let a smart gun controller fight against a atom bomb On the left side, you see the two coordinators of the Manhattan Project. <laughs> there was not m much left, but the soil, you can see it, there are cracks inside. The soil has been compressed because of uh, heat and pressure, and it became glass. And there is some material from the first uh, atomic bomb, which is inside. It's called trinitite. And uh, mineral collectors uh, have uh, may have some and you can maybe buy it it is not ra ra radioactive anymore after 70 almost 70 years there's not so much radioactivity left but there is still some alpha radiation and uh, it is enough so it works if you use the, the glass side uh, and put it on the chip and this chip shows effects. This is the question, does it work really good? No, we have to say that it works really bad, but we uh, just thought that it has to be made once. All right, so <laughs> now we have a small variety of different attacks and uh, under these circumstances it's interesting to see what sort of statements you can find um, once one i quoted um, already attacks will not work because we use the smallest technology nodes um, with uh, background knowledge about modern technology um, this is a statement where you can just uh, smile a bit today but our personal highlights uh, from these statements are the absolute ones. For example, attacks are impossible. Um, such, um, such statements, or the last one, our personal top favorite, if a function is called unclonable. I don't think we have to uh, talk about this here. Um, there's no such thing as 100% uh, security. So with these statements, we have to um, look at them and see what do they actually mean by that. But an even uh, bigger security nightmare could be a scenario that we want to introduce from a whole different world from the automobile and uh, fridge um, compartments. For example, from cars, we know some of them have special optimization for the um, for the gas usage, they're optimized so they get uh, good uh, marks on those tests. So if you use these cars in uh, with regular uh, usage, 
you uh, noticed uh, that uh, it uses more gas than you thought it would. So you can't reach the uh, optimal test scenarios. And we don't know if this uh, optimization is built in or not. Um, also from the fridge uh, department, um, it's been said that one uh, company actually um, built a microcontroller into a fridge and this microcontroller should contain a special analysis program which uh, states exactly, oh look we have um, this temperature and then this temperature and uh, they always use a certain temperature if uh, uh, the energy glass is being um, tested so uh, the fridge knows, oh, I'm being tested, I, I'll cool a little bit less and so also the energy usage goes back. And <laughs> what happens to the stuff in the fridge uh, at that time, we don't know. But of course this can lead to uh, this fridge having a better energy label than it sh really should deserve. And so the... Um, um, everyday usage should, you can see, uh, much higher energy usage. So if we have these two scenarios and now look at security chips, a nightmare would be that if these scenarios from the tests um, exactly uh, are recognized by the uh, chip controller and lead to some sort of alarm. So a concrete example, um, so classic examples are uh, small lasers. So now a chip could have a detector built in that doesn't look out for security but just for lasers. And all the, uh, and it could just, uh, once it detects a laser, it could just um, have some sort of security mode activated on the chip or just destroy the chip in total. But if we change a little bit as an attacker, a little, uh, a little different wavelength or a different impulse, so it's um, hard to believe that a laser detector would um, be able to recognize these uh, slight changes. So a nightmare would be if uh, there were countermeasures in this um, department. So the classic, uh, of course, is snake oil, and I don't think I have to uh, talk about snake oil right here. You kn you all know it, and what the what the dangers are. Um, there's some signals also in the uh, security chip area. Uh, for example, words like unhackable. Um, oh, uh, buzzwords like 100% secure uh, can be warning signs. So sometimes uh, there's good stories behind questionable technologies. Um, but if you defend one attack, it uh, actually might happen that you um, that this uh, one defense leads to uh, 10 new ways of attack. But um, and through this, a very well secured systems uh, can suddenly become uh, um, open for attacks through well meant measures. So this can lead astray. So uh, in the box below you can see uh, <laughs> um, a well meant uh, function, um, a scenario. This is about physically unclonable functions and as you can see uh, we put it in a uh, uh, and how do we make a hardware trojan from that so to illustrate um, what's what's this a physically unclonable functions about um, we assume if you build uh, REM cells on a chip card, then you always have a slight degree of um, uh, differences. So, and if you uh, turn on such a cell, 
it can either um, be a one or a zero. So if you turn on a uh, RAM uh, memory, um, it can actually look like uh, these uh, RAM cells have a certain. Some of them tend to uh, be a one, and some of them tend to be a zero, and this is this is indeed um, dependable on the process. And so we have uh, so from this you can uh, get um, specific uh, data about a certain chip. Uh, but there's a problem with this. Uh, of course, it sounds great, but an attacker uh, can actually use this. So, for example, using using the production step, you can add a step which will help you that the preferential direction of these RAM chips is no longer done by at random, randomly generated, but rather it, he can act on it. So, for example, you could do this by or by enhancing the area of the chip which ten leads it to 10 towards 1 and there are also other uh, technologies which means the attacker w the attacker can basically force the chips to the rams to uh, f flip in a certain pattern which is exactly the pattern that he expects To recognize such an attack is very difficult uh, e when you do a certification or when you or the f done product because the, the data looks exactly like ran like randomly generated but you have and which means a big problem well we're not the only people who think about these issues well it's always the case when something is being declared declares unhackable lots of researchers will attack this problem. We're not the only ones, as I said. Well, in general, whenever you call something unhackable, it's like it's like giving honey to a beehive. Right. The question is, what else does the uh, DIY hack lab want? Well, back, back well way back well we wanted a, an electron microscope too so that we could look at chips in detail nowadays the electron beam source is what we want because that's basically like a swiss army knife and is basically very versatile and here's just a few ideas what you could do with such an electron beam apart from these high resolution pictures which i talked about earlier it's also possible to focus the beam on a specific spo spot and to observe what kind of information is f comes over this particular channel. So for example, two ideas of getting more information from the chip. But even for uh, uh, noise attacks, you could use this electron beam. On the one hand, when the electron beam impacts, which uh, leads, leads to temporary disturbances in the chip in the circuit or if you do put a high voltage on to trigger uh, x-ray radiation upon impact and once uh, x-ray radiation impacts an area for a longer while this can uh, lead to permanent damage on the silicon which means that you can uh, affect analog values or in or uh, details of the sensing or other pieces of information and you can basically change these values and last but not least another interesting thing is you can lead the electron beam to the back of a chip which you've uh, previously put a foil on which allows you to uh, uh, if, if upon which you've put on structure well, one of the questions that comes up quite frequently is who has electron microscope at home? Well, that's indeed the question. Well, often people say you need like big kit and you need to buy that. 
well, frequently you can actually rent this sort of kit. And since this is now generate like many, many generations onwards, you can now actually buy some of them. You have to be a bit careful, but it is indeed possible. And you can indeed set it up at home, as I'm showing here, if you manage to actually get your hands on them. Well, it's not quite done yet. Well, you need a little bit of space in your living room. And also you need to be able to choose the device. You have to be a bit careful and don't buy just any old junk. But in, you can actually get this quite cheap. So manual was included, luckily. But that leads, you do get, get this salad of cables. And, and don't forget you need certain media like uh, water or cooling systems etc etc and you have to be careful but i am we are uh, we are happy to give you tips and after a while this looks quite nice at the moment it's still running windows 98 using an x86 well it's still expandable uh, this uh, micro uh, micro you see is basically connected with the scuzzy port this is the vacuum systems, which is inside. It's quite convenient for an amateur if it, when it has a diffusion pump, which is basically this uh, spiral here, it's a bit like a centrifuge, and nothing. there's no really moving parts. It's just uh, uh, oil moving faster than the speed of sound, and it's quite, quite easy and doesn't require a lot of maintenance. Right, once it's done, it looks like this easy to use, which was the aim of the project. And if you have a bit of time, that's what you can do. Or if you have a lot of time, you can make it a little bit more modern. For us, it's interesting to do things like electron beam lithography, which is what which looks like this, one of the expansion stages. I haven't done a lot. Just to say it is possible to uh, acquire such big kit nowadays. It's no longer the case that you need huge clunky machines to be standing around and you need to like uh, ma maintain it for three weeks. Now we've uh, tried to uh, encompass these 25 years uh, with a high compression factor. There are still quite a few questions and we have a few minutes still for questions, I hope. Otherwise, we would like to to uh, offer some practical app app applications tomorrow in, in Hall 3. There's a practical workshop and there's a few experiments to, so that you can try it out a bit. And just like we did. And you can attack some chip cards and, and look what, what's really inside them. The whole, we said that also at the same time, here's a few images from 1992. The announcement on the one hand, on the other side, the picture, what the workshop looked like back then. It was in the middle of the night. What what sort of things were built in the middle of the night? And well, a warm invitation to come to the workshop in Hall 3. Otherwise, I would like to uh, encourage you to go to the talk after this to learn about uh, current state of the art technology that you can use to do attacks. And he will also present some methods to attack the chip from the backside in much more detail than we were able to do. Otherwise, thank you very much. And we're ready to answer questions. So the question, the time for question is uh, restricted, but if you have really important questions, you have microphones in the room, you know how it moves. And we have one question from the internet. Can you estimate, uh, please, the cost for electron microscopes? Yes, this is about uh, f f four digits uh, space. So. 
maybe between five and eight thousand euros. You uh, should not forget that you need special stuff like air compressor, which are not too loud. I have tested uh, with the 80 euro compressor, but it had 96 decibel. This was too much, so uh, you need something else. Really important is that uh, you don't buy any uh, uh, use corrupt stuff. It's really better to wait something until you get something good. I looked about five, six years and uh, I had one opportunity and I bought it. Go, the time is over. Please applaud uh, Marcos on time.